Hi and welcome to another episode of ECCB Connects. This week we'll bring you excerpts from the first of the ECCB Distinguished Alumni Series featuring Dr. Oral Williams. About 10 years ago, I was then at the World Bank, based in Washington, D.C. And from time to time, I would meet with our colleagues at the IMF and the World Bank, IDB, and so on, um, OS. And we would talk over lunch, over what they call a coffee, which is not really a coffee, but it's a moment in time where you stop and catch up and so on. And I always enjoy those interactions. Delilah, Worrell, Barbados, we, all, we also met during those times. And I came away always, obviously very gratified about being able to touch base with, with, our, with our, our guys. But I always came away with this probing um, feeling, <coughs> this thought, that some of our best minds were in Washington. Some of the best and brightest economists of this region were in Washington. And I wonder to myself, how could we tap into these minds based in D.C. or wherever they were stationed? I recognize the fact that they had served their time, they had paid their dues, and they had moved on professionally. So there was no issue there um, about them going on to the IMF or wherever they, 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 they were. Many of them were at the IMF and still are. But I, 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 I often wonder to myself, how could we tap into these minds? So this is a question that has been with me for the last 10 years. That's where I'm going with this. And so, on assuming office as governor, I did say to you that one of the things I would like to do is to reach out and get our alumni more involved. I see one of our very distinguished ones who is locally based here this afternoon, Mrs. Sheila Williams. And Sheila, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate your presence. Um, so that I've reflected on this and um, thought about how we can engage our, 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 our... Because you see, the ECCB is more than a, a family, although we, we're that. We have a big diaspora, many of which are, as I said, sitting at the IMF. Last April, while in Washington for the spring meetings, I approached Oral, Dr. Williams, about being part of this outreach. And I must tell you that he immediately said, Governor, I'm prepared to do this. Today, his presence with us is a clear testimony that he is a man of his word. What I would like us to take away from this narrative, this exchange of ideas, is that what we do is what defines us. And I'd like to weave in a couple overarching guiding principles to get to where I would like us to go. So brace yourself for the journey. And I, I, I want to perhaps coin it as joining up the dots, because I think a lot of times we know the what of what we experience or we think we do, but we, the why of it comes much later. So the first guiding principle I would like to touch on is economics. And I think the cl one classical de definition would be it's the study of consumption and production and the transfer of wealth. The American Economics Association says that it's people making decisions subject to constraints, budget constraints. And in so doing, we make choices, we trade off. But at the end of the day, it's incentives. Um, we are human, and as the good book says that, where your heart is, there you'll find your treasure. And where your treasure is, there will be your heart as also. So people do what they think is in their best interest. And so let's not forget that you're dealing with human beings. So even though the title of an economist may sound lofty and glorious, at the end of the day, we, in a way, we are all economists because we are making choices at a micro level, and if you aggregate it, you get it to the macro level. But it begins with a sense of belief, it begins with a sense of will, and it has aspects of culture. 
um, you may want to debate why 40% of the population in the U.S. wants to vote for Trump because some believe we want America great again. That's just what they believe. Or you could look at why did St. Kitts and Nevis choose to run up their debt to over 150% because of sugar? Well, you got to understand the history of where the country is coming from, why there could be a possible reason for pursuing such a policy. So at the end of the day, um, it's incentives and people make choices. So I think th that's one of the first overarching guiding principles I'd like to touch on. The second one is basically what we call we call it equilibrium, it sounds fancy, but it's basically balance. In all things, if nature is not in balance, we get hurricanes, we get earthquakes. If we are not in balance, we get ill. So that was the first principle, the first dot. It was a small dot for me. And you may ask yourself, well, how did you become a, an economist? And uh, in fact, there was no real path. It was just seemingly random dots. And initially, I wanted to do medicine, and uh, Daniel would know that one of my best friends is, is one of the leading doctors here because we, I wanted to be a doctor. But somehow, I did economics in that mix with physics and chemistry and biology, and I go like, what the heck? What does this have to do with anything? Thinking that, well, you know, I'd go to the UK and pursue that line of, of, of inquiry, and ended up falling in love with the British landscape, reminded me of home, and decided to do agriculture. And then I quickly realized, well, you know, the incentives of agriculture in the region, this is not an industry or area that's going to go very far. So that economics that I did ah, came in handy. So then I said, well, let me pursue that path. What I, what I discovered much later was that many of my colleagues at the IMF are not economists by training or in their first degrees. And what that said to me was that they brought a richness to the type of problems they have to solve because somehow in the randomness and seemingly unrelated events, um, some were political scientists. In fact, the current director of the African department, he's an economic historian. So his first degree is in economics, but his, his specialization is economic history from the LSE, and you go, well, how does that help him? Well, if you want to know where you're going, you've got to know where you're coming from, right? There are others who are political scientists who advise the managing director. So then I realized that, wait, back up. Um, the label does not define who you are. What matters in self-mastery is knowing, is being, and doing. So in your own little way, by doing what you do, you develop. So whether you be an accountant or a MBA finance, what matters is what you do. The other overarching principle that I'd like to touch on is that it's important to understand how institutions evolve, how belief system evolve, whether you agree with it or not. And one of, one of the great thinkers of our, the last century was a gentleman by the name of Karl Popper, who was an Austrian philosopher. But for those of us who did graduate school and you had to do the philosophy of the science, you, you had to understand how economic thought evolved over time. Most of you would have heard of um, John Maynard Keynes and uh, Al Alfred Marshall, but there was also Popper. And what Popper said that, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a, a, a medical doctor or an engineer, in your subject matter, what you're really doing is you're solving problems, right? And in so doing, your knowledge is very finite, but your ignorance is infinite. So what does this tell you? That you have to be humble. You only recognize what you know. You see what you want, first of all, and you recognize what you know. So this calls for the second overarching guiding principle of tolerance and humility. In a funny way, we all have little pieces of some sort of reality, but it's by collaborating you get to a closer definition of the truth. And one of the things that I realize is that the IMF is a strange creature. Okay, you have representatives from 188 countries. But in order for me to go with a policy brief to a country, I'm subjected to a very brutal review. 
and it's brutal because you, the, the accountants look at it, the money and capital markets people look at it, the communications people look at, well, what about the communicate outreach aspects of what you're doing? What are you going to say to the press at the end? And maybe we need to coach you in how to body language, nuance, and so on. So by going through this meat grinder process, it's humbling, but I get a better definition of my reality. So I, I want you to, to understand that when you send things out for review within the bank and you get comments, you may not like the comments, but th there's no pain without gain and there's no gain without pain. It, it helps you get a better sense of, of, of what you're trying to describe. So that's the second overarching principle I'd like to, to touch on. The other thing is that I then realized that, as, as the governor said, I went to CDB, and it was a much better paying job, right? Duty free, all the perks, and Barbados is a little quirky place to live in, but you know, you, you get over the speed bumps. But then, again, as I mentioned, the other guiding principle in, in, all, in all of what we do, whether it's nature or individually, is a sense of balance. There's always something that drives you for results. So I took a pay cut, and someone would say, well, that's very irrational to do. You know, more is preferred to less that economics teaches you, than, and some is preferred to none. But what happened at the ECCB was that the brain trust at the ECCB was one of the most unenviable. In Barbados or Jamaica or Trinidad, you have one country, but here you had eight countries with different talents. Some have French background, uh, St. Lucia, Dominica, um, St. Vincent, Grenada have an old, their own different, and you had that agglomeration, if I want to put it that way, of talent in the bank. And what that did was that it fostered the collaboration that that made the bank stand out. And so, <clears throat> so the economists would sit with the banking supervision counterparts because they have a report to write, we have a report to write, and so we would exchange ideas. And from that collaboration, like I said, we only see in part, we got a better definition of our economies. Now, let me give you uh, an anecdote. I don't know if it's still true. Um, I'm sure there's a St. Vincent representative in one of the regional offices, but we couldn't figure out, and BMOD was, you know, we, we manage all the liquidity, the, the, you know, put the liquidity around. St. Vincent always had the most liquidity in the system. Why? Well, they grow a special product, <laughs> and there's a lot of informal activity. They would get in speedboats and go all the way to St. Martin. No one from outside can tell you that. So this is your strength. If you want to cross the river, you've got to ask the locals where to cross. And you here in the central bank have that specialty knowledge. Sure, my colleagues from the IMF will jet in, but they don't know the landscape like you do. So that's your advantage, right? They can only approximate your reality for over two weeks, but they're good at it. So you complement what they do. So you should not feel any less. Now, we were doing here in the bank um, what the IMF now calls macrofinancial linkages. It sounds fancy, but all it says is that how do policies impact the financial sector? And how does the financial sector react in turn? Well, we were doing that with banking supervision and BMOD. We'd go down by Ingrid Short and the investment unit to understand, well, why is um, dividends lower this year than last year? Well, you know, the interest rates were low internationally, so the senior age is less, the return on the assets were less, so you know, maybe you guys can't travel as much because things are tight. So we had a, a good view of the operations of the bank. And so I say to you that this platform foundation on which the bank has been established is one that persists today, and it's one that you should continue to leverage. At that time, we were getting in summer interns from everywhere. Um, uh, 
Um, the most celebrated one is now the dean at Stern Business School, Peter Blair Henry. And he came here from MIT. At that time too, and I want to emphasize the role of collaboration, um, the region was going through a very difficult um, time with the um, suspension or the doing away with preferential access for bananas. So we had a resident expert. If you want to go bananas, you talk to Wayne Sandyfoot. He knew bananas like nobody else. So Wayne and I, and there's a young man named Bushy, I don't know if he's here. So we got together and we wrote this paper. At that time, in the bank, no one thought, well, you know, you could actually publish something on the region internationally. We did it. We didn't do did it because we were smarter than anybody else. We did it because we collaborated. You might have heard that the sum is greater than the, 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 the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts. Well, Bushy knew the data, and he was a computer whiz, right? And we got that paper out. Now, some of you may know Paul Cashin from the IMF. No, that paper is the paper he cites. Then Leah, Leah Sihaly and Reggie Darius, we did a follow-up paper to say, okay, what, how does it affect the balance of payments, the current account of the ECCB? Because that was a relevant question, and the question was an empirical question. We could have said, well, maybe not, maybe not, but we were able to quantify it. And you're talking about in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. right? So any, any, anyone writing about adjustment in a currency area would cite this work. And the point is that if you don't tell your story, it becomes his story. You're watching ECCB Connects, protecting our currency, developing our region. And now for this week's financial tip. The only practical way to take control of your spending and to make sure you are using your money wisely is the budget. So create a budget that will guide you as to how you spend your weekly or monthly income and then stick to it. To view any episode of ECCB Connects anytime, any place, at your convenience, check out our YouTube channel, ECCB Connects. This is where we end another episode of ECCB Connects. Remember, ECCB Connects is produced by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to help you understand who we are, what we do, and how we serve you. Thanks for watching. Do join us again next week for another program.